and it's it's great to be here. Thank you so much. It's a, it's an honor to be here. So I'm gonna I'm gonna start a little sh a screen share. I have a a, a presentation to to, uh, to 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 give you all today. Uh, thank you all so much. It's it's lovely to be here. Lovely to have your attention. And uh, I'm Jeremiah. Um, so the bio that, that Cheryl uh, just read was a, a little old. The, 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 I was at Yale last year, and this year I'm a, uh, an, a fellow at the Katz Center at at uh, at, at uh, University of Pennsylvania. And uh, let's um, that's uh, where I'm I'm continuing my my research about uh, early 20th century cantorial music, and then I'll be talking to you a little bit about some of the research I'm I'm doing now, as well as work I've done in the past today. Uh, chazonus is a uh, the, the Yiddish word for the work of the cantor for the cantorial art music, and uh, the term is often associated with a, a period in Jewish popular cultural history that people sometimes refer to as the golden age. Well, what is a golden age? I mean, it's always a, a matter of retrospection of of looking back back at something from a point in the future and deciding that this point in history uh, we will call uh, a, a site of perfection or something that that uh, that is greater than ourselves and that we have fallen in relationship to. And I think in the study of Jewish music, the past is always uh, the past is always greater. The past is always correct. And the current moment is always seen as being an attempt to reclaim the past. To, to create something in the in the current moment, which is going to uh, in some way uh, resuscitate or uh, uh, reincarnate the past, and that's something that's been true. That that's been a way Jewish musicians have talked about their music for a very very long time. You know, as long as long as we have documentation of what cantors and other Jewish musicians said about their work, they were talking about how the past was great, and we're going and we have fallen, and we are going to somehow try to recreate the past. Uh, but that takes on sort of a different color in the 20th century, because all of a sudden the past uh, becomes a little less abstract because now we have recordings. We can actually hear what, what the music of the past sounded like. So the idea of uh, a revival or a, a reincarnation or a, 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 a cohabitation with the ghosts of the past is all of a sudden transformed into something which is which is kind of possible in a way because of of the um, of the influence of, of electronic media as this kind of second self that gives us uh, uh, extra life, extra consciousness that we we share with with um, with revered artists of the past. So the Cantorial Golden Age, uh, people when they, when people use this term, they're usually talking about the early twentieth century and the music that was recorded uh, on commercial re record labels in the early 20th century. So when the the, re the record industry began, uh, artists were being recorded from all around the world, right? The, the, the recorded music industry was incredibly diverse in the first few decades of the 20th century. And there were uh, record studios and record companies all around the world and the major record labels uh, the major record labels were very international and very concerned with um, creating a lot of different markets. So there were there were there were um, uh, imprints uh, that were part of major record labels for a lot of different ethnic and linguistic groups, including for Jews. Right. So the first the first records of of um, of Jewish music were of cantors. And these re records, uh, the first one that we know about is from 1901, which is also very, very early in the recorded music industry. The, fir the first cantor to be recorded was named uh, Zelmar Sherini, uh, which was his stage name. And as the name uh, might might indicate, it's it's sort of supposed to sound kind of kind of Italian, right? He was a, a cantor who also sang opera. And uh, Sherini is a bit of a, a historical footnote because he was immediately followed by cantors who were much more famous, but. He is the the opening point of of uh, J J Jewish music as a form of recorded sound, uh, and these records have uh, stayed with us until the present moment uh, through 
reissue prop reissue albums that were were released uh, after after the Second World War. And today the records are in circulation online. Uh, the, you know there are hundreds, thousands, uh, maybe tens of thousands of, of early twentieth century cantorial records that are that are are streaming on YouTube and other 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 kinds of sites. So, uh, Let's see. Uh, I'm gonna. I want. I want to. To. I. I know that m many of you have probably engaged with cantors. Maybe some of the. Some. Some of you on on this Zoom are cantors yourselves. And I want to kind of uh, ask you to suspend uh, your knowledge a little bit in our conversation today. Suspend what you know about cantors because uh, the word cantor has been used to describe many many different kinds of people over the course of Jewish history. And today, what a cantor uh, does and the kinds of work and the kinds of music that cantors do is uh, quite distinct from the cantors of this uh, early 20th century period that, that I'm gonna be talking about. And uh, okay, so uh, what I am uh, asking you to believe is that cantors in the early 20th century uh, were a kind of a popular artist. Right, artists who used elements of of Jewish uh, folkloric ritual traditions from the synagogue to create uh, personality, or artistic personalities that were meant for uh, mass media. Right, that cantors were were uh, uh, artists who were supposed to be creative, who were supposed to have very individual, unique styles that could be marketed, um, and who were speaking the language of popular culture. Who were uh, were representing the the sound of the Jewish community, but in a way which would, could be uh, consumed as a as a popular art form, and that the kinds of artists who did who did well in this kind of marketplace uh, in which cantors were competitive with one another, in which cantors were trying to um, to tr to uh, to reach out to audiences uh, from from the, the, from uh, a position of being an artist not only a ritual functionary uh were uh, were uh, uh, kind of like star vocal artists in the, uh, somewhat in the model of caruso or other early 20th century uh vo vocal stars of the early of the earlier uh, recorded music industry uh so my uh, understanding of what uh, cantors in the early 20th century uh, were what their music meant, what the kinds of personalities that created uh, the the music, uh, and what the how the music functioned in the in the lives of of Jewish listeners is uh, shaped to a very uh, great degree by the work that I have done with cantors in the Hasidic community. So my my thesis research and my first book, which is coming out in a few months, uh, is focuses on. Uh, contemporary cantors in the Hasidic community uh, in Brooklyn who are making music which does not fit with the musical and cultural norms of their community, who are have this kind of individualistic, uh, non-conformist art practice using early 20th century cantorial records as the basis for for their new project of um, of performance and uh, and self cultivation as artists. Uh, I think, you know, it, it, from an outsider perspective, the association with Hasidic Jews who are understood to be uh, heavily focused on preservation of the past and on a kind of a conservative attitude towards religion with early 20th century cantorial music, that might seem, oh, that like something that would make total sense, right? What? But the reality is that music in the Hasidic community is one of the areas where the community is the most uh, modernized, basically, right? The, that the music of the contemporary Hasidic community is uh, sounds a lot like commercial pop music genres of today. Right. And so that for artists for, and intellectuals within the community, uh, when they are seeking out uh, styles that will allow them to do something which is more focused on aesthetics, uh, more sophisticated from the, the standpoint of, uh, of, a, um, of, a, of, of a musically oriented person, the, the style that they look to is a Jewish genre, but one which is outside of the, the, the norms of the everyday musical life that they've been uh, that they were brought up in. So uh, I want to give you just a little taste of 
uh, what I have uh, been writing and talking about as being the the uh, the cantorial revival in the Hasidic community. Uh, this is a this is a video from a party, a music making party in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, uh, in the home of a, a Satmar Hasidic man, and uh, with a bunch of of uh, young young singers. So here here's a here's a little bit of that. <laughs> That was a, a cast of uh, of uh, young artists from the Satmar community, and all, all all of the the men in this in this video are between their mid twenties to I think the oldest artist in the room was was forty years old. Uh, it's uh, to some extent a youth sub, sub subculture, I would say, and um, and this is a night in the summertime uh, when. Uh, their w their families are in bungalow colonies on vacation in the Catskills, and this is a kind of like a a, a, a party night, right? This is a, this is a, an a, a, an evening where where artistically inclined uh, men in their in their early adult years are experimenting with uh, different forms of self expression than. Uh, uh, are 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 typical are the norm in in their uh, in their community. So I, I was very uh, looking looking at their their work and at, at the, the work of these Hasidic cantors. Uh, I was very curious about uh, their perspective on the music that Has that cantorial uh, music could be. Uh, you know they're not they're not going and becoming jazz musicians or you know they're they're what they're the 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 art form that they're looking to as a, an expression of of freedom or of as uh, as com uh, uh, as an expression of commentary on the aesthetics of the Jewish community uh, would be cantorial music right so their their perspective on the history of the music uh, got me to look at the early twentieth century cantorial uh, golden age. And tr to try to understand what what qualities 
uh, in here in the music that would make it be right for a uh, would make it be appropriate for a, a practice of, of nonconformity and of uh, musical experimentation. So uh, looking back into the, into the archive, uh, we, we take a step backwards and look at, um, I, I'm gonna start now with a kind of a, a, a very uh, broad thumbnail sketch of the history of, of, uh, of the modern cantorial musical phenomenon. So uh, there have been cantors who were, uh, professional prayer leaders uh, working in synagogues uh, for many centuries, but we know very little about cantorial music before the 19th century. And the first cantor that we really have a great deal of documentation about his, his musical life and, and work is, is the cantor who was also involved in a radical project of transformation of cantorial music. So this is Solomon Sulzer, this is the gentleman in this picture here who was a cantor working in Vienna uh, beginning in 1826 when the Jewish community of Vienna was very young, right? Jew Jews were uh, an, an elite group of Jews who were very wealthy, were allowed residence uh, and status uh, in the in the capital of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And this this small and uh, and kind of a self uh, ex exploring um, Jewish community of, in Vienna wanted to have a, a religious community uh, that would represent its changing status as both distinctly Jewish but participating in the modern nation state. So this was going to be reflected both in terms of uh, the way their their synagogue uh, was organized and with the, the kind of rabbi who they would have preaching in, to them in German, not in Yiddish, but it would also be uh, be expressed, this kind of changing status of the Jews would also be expressed through music. And the community hired Solomon Sulzer, who was uh, trained as a, a traditional cantor in the in the German tradition, but who was also uh, a musician kind of in the in the broader sense of being a participant in in European classical music. So that Seltzer was a friend of Franz Schubert. He studied composition uh, with Viennese uh, classical musicians and he he wrote a lot of his own music but also he also hired Schubert and other other Viennese composers to compose new music for the synagogue. So he Seltzer's music, was both an, uh, uh, a work of preservation in that he was using Western notation extensively to write down uh, cantorial melodies, but also a work of uh, very radical transformation in terms of bringing sounds of uh, Western art music into the synagogue. And there's a kind of a, an apologetics in this music that, that in order for Jews to be uh, viable as participants in modernity, they also needed to transform their their ritual music. Uh, the Cantorial Golden Age, uh, this that we discussed earlier, this kind of early mediated period, directly grew out of the response of cantors in Eastern Europe to the Central European uh, musical phenomenon of, of modernization. So cantors in uh, elite synagogues in in Odessa, in Kiev, and in, in the other ma major uh, uh, met metropolitan centers of, of the Russian Empire and in Poland, uh, were uh, creating music that was influenced by Sulzer, that uh, drew on elements of this kind of uh, westernizing uh, choral music, uh, but in a way that created room for uh the 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 statement of a of a eastern european style cantorial uh, approach in the in the the lead melodies that would be sung by the cantor so this kind of a uh, uh, what was called, was always referred to in yiddish as the korshul a choir synagogue uh, a new musical style emerged that was uh, self-consciously uh, attempting to synthesize uh, this this the Sulzer approach to Jewish music with uh, sounds that were uh, conceived of as representing the Jewish folkloric past, the Hasidic tradition, uh, the sounds of small town baltafilas, and this musical concept is what uh, what was documented on early early cantorial records, and the the cantors who were uh, the best uh, able to uh to take advantage of the possibilities of the 
of the, the new medium of the record were cantors who were uh, incredibly talented vocal artists who sounded like opera singers, but were also able to uh, create a sound that was legible to Jews as, as representing the collective. Right. This was a very. This is a very important part of of the the early era of um, of recorded music. Is that people wanted to hear some kind of like a reflection of themselves in the music that was being recorded, and artists had to navigate uh, people's expectations and also create new new ideas about how uh, how to how to sound Jewish on record. Right. This is uh, and uh, the cantorial voices of artists like Gershon Sroda who was the, the kind of the first international star of, of Jewish music, who's pictured here, uh, became kind of the, uh, the, the, the musical solutions that Sirota and some of his peers came up with uh, were uh, extremely persuasive, right? They, they, these guys made records that, that sold in the hundreds of thousands and, uh, and created a concept of what Jewish tradition is supposed to sound like. So uh, when I when I began this uh, this talk a few minutes ago talking about oh, I want I want you to to suspend disbelief right to Dis suspend disbelief about what a cantor is and what a cantor should sound like uh, I am thinking about the kind of uh, frenetic creativity that was coming out in this period and uh, and the multiple. Uh, political and, and cultural communities the cantors were part of. So I'm, I'm, I want to play for you a little bit of, of Lieb Glantz's music. And Gl Glantz was one of, uh, I would say that, you know, he was a, a, an intellectual in terms of writing about the music, but but he, what he had to say about, about cantors uh, was kind of representative of the way the cantors thought about themselves. And Glantz was a, a political activist as well as being uh, as well as being a great musician, and he was uh, very, very deeply involved in in Jewish socialist political causes and in, and in Zionist causes, and which were not uh, antithetical to each other. Right? I think in, in the Amer North American context today, there's um, there's a kind of a perception that uh, Jewish socialism and and Zionism are are two distinct. Uh, political streams that run uh, against each other are not uh, in in uh, don't run against each other, uh, but in in the early twentieth century that was definitely not the case, right? That these the, the Jewish labor movement and the Zionist movement were very uh, closely intertwined. Uh, so Glantz wrote about cantorial music as being a, a kind of. Um, a Jewish proletariat uh, sound, right? That this that the, the cantor is represented uh, the sound of uh, of Jewish life in uh, in a state of uh, of political oppression, right? And that the this was the the voice of the people um, uh, rising up, right? And and uh, giving giving voice to its its uh, urgently felt need for for economic and political liberation. So I'm going to play a little a little piece of Glantz's music, uh, and well, I, I'll, you know, I'm very curious to to to, to know what, what, hear hear your thoughts about what what it sounds like. So, uh, you know, maybe in the in the in the talk back afterwards, we can talk a little bit more about his music. But I'll play play a little piece. This is one of his uh, very well known records, Kihine Kachomer, uh, and recorded in New York City. The 
Okay, the the piece goes on from there, but uh, we'll maybe we'll, we'll leave it leave it leave it there for now, uh, so we can have uh, a chance to listen to to other artists as well. That was Lieb Glantz. Uh, and okay, so I wanted to talk uh, also about uh, the Chazantas, who were the Chazanta is a, a Yiddish word uh, that uh, means uh, a cantor's wife, but was repurposed uh, starting in the 19 teens and 20s uh, to describe uh, women performers of cantor music. So uh, as uh, as I have kind of been been uh, g gesturing towards in this talk, there's a movement. Uh, of the of the cantor from uh, a position as a functionary in the synagogue to a kind of a, a public uh, figure, a public intellectual, public representative of the community, maybe working in synagogues, but also in in the public sphere. And then in the early twentieth century, with the emergence of mass media, uh, the the um, the cantor is now also a, 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 the new, has a new venue for their work in electron electronically mediated forms and on stage oftentimes as well right so cantors would be heard on phonograph records as we've as we've we've been mentioning also on radio 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 was a very very uh, com common uh, venue for cantorial performance and then in in different kinds of of, of uh, theatrical performances so these new spaces of cantorial form performance outside of the synagogue uh, were no longer regulated uh, were not regulated by the same uh, traditions and norms as the synagogue and uh, uh, the issues around uh, traditional conceptions of who can or cannot be a cantor uh, typically kept women out of leadership positions in synagogues uh, we know that there were women who did work as as prayer leaders in synagogues in europe uh, mostly for other women but right? this is something that is uh, increasingly understood that there were a variety of forms of women, spiritual workers, some who, who led prayers who, uh, for other women, uh, and some who did other kinds of, of spiritual practices uh, that are generally considered kind of more like folkloric customs, like uh, people who, who um, did divination or spoke to the dead or had, had their other kinds of, uh, of uh, spirit, spiritual work that was not necessarily under the uh, auspices of, of rabbinic authority, but that was an important part of the folk life of, of Jews in Europe. In the United States, uh, Yiddish speaking Jews uh, generally, as far as I know, we're not, we're not employing women uh, to work as like Zagarkas who could speak to their dead ancestors, but they were interested in women's voices as performers of cantorial music, right? So the, the first, um, the first mention I've seen of, of a, a, a chazanta, meaning a, a, a woman can, cantor, uh, is from a, um, an advertisement I found in a, a Yiddish newspaper from uh, nineteen, I think nineteen sixteen or something like that. But there's no explanation. There's a, there's going to be the chaz, a chazanta will will sing on this on this concert. It's like it's already something people know about, right? It was something that was part of the culture. And uh, by the early twenties, uh, this woman on the right, Sophie Kurtzer, was a major star in the cantorial scene in New York. She was recording in the same period as. Uh, Yasela Rosenblatt, you know, she was she was among the first among the first cantors to, to record in the United States, and uh, and had uh, a prominent a prominent career as a performer, and then um, I have here uh, as well Shandela the Chazanta, who she, she's a bit a bit later, uh, she was a, a star of the the. Um, of the 40s, uh, especially uh, on Jewish radio stations, Yiddish radio stations. And the, on the left, I have one of the, the Malovsky daughters, the daughters of Samuel Malovsky, who is uh, one of the you know most most uh, uh, popular can cantors of the of the 30s, but who in his uh, in the 40s and 50s began working with his, with his family choir, in which his daughter uh, Goldie Malovsky was the lead. The lead uh, the soloist and who he kind of groomed to be his his successor who, who he trained in his nusach in his in his cantorial style uh so in uh, uh, the yiddish speaking immigrant milieu in the united states women perform women's performance of cantorial music in this early period i'm not talking about in the post 1970s when when the liberal movements began to ordain cantors i'm talking about 
before the Holocaust or, you know, up, up through the, the, you know, the 1950s in this period, women's performance of, of, of sacred music was, was a part of the life of the community. And this, this is, has been, uh, largely erased, right? It's not, it's not particularly well understood or known, uh, even among women cantors today of, you know, in the current moment, uh, women make up the majority of the cantorate in the United States. Um, and it's, I think there's a, 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 a switch is beginning to happen where people are beginning to understand that there, there was a women's Jewish sacred music scene in, um, in an earlier generation, but, uh, perhaps in part because this style of music is not so well understood anymore. The, the these women, women artists in this style, um, their work has, has not been, uh, reclaimed in the way that I uh, hope it will be. But anyway, I'd love to play for you a, a little bit of the music of Sophie Kurtzer. Uh, this is, um, okay, here we are. We'll listen now. <laughs> remarkable piece of music uh, from 1926, also from New York City. That was Sophie Kurtzer. Uh, let's, uh, let's, uh, so this, this period of the aesthetic, the aestheticization of, of sacred music, the idea that, that uh, music, uh, so let's see, the, this, the work of the cantor exists in these two different spheres. They're intimately related with each other. There's the, the realm of aesthetics and of popular performance, and the realm of the synagogue. And the idea that uh, that these two different spheres could become out of harmony with each other, and that focusing on the aesthetic element 
could cause some kind of damage to the sacredness of the music or to the integrity of the community uh, became uh, a, a fear that was expressed by, uh, by critics of Cantor's. And the, the, the lead voices in this criticism of the aesthetic movement or the, the commercial uh, mediated form of, of Jewish sacred music, the lead critics were themselves Cantor's. Right, so there, it was a kind of a, a generational and intergenerational conflict. Uh, this gentleman on the left, Pinchas Minkowski, who was uh, the cantor of the Broder Synagogue in Odessa, who's kind of the the the, the big uh, prestigious uh, synagogue in in, in Odessa. Uh, he was also a prolific author, and he wrote a kind of a, an extended diatribe, a kind of a, a, a pamphlet a, um, a, a, against against cantorial records in 1911. Um, and in it, he suggested that cantorial records were an abuse of the sacred authority of, of the of the music, and that by unyoking cantorial music from its set time in the, in the liturgical calendar and its set place in the synagogue would lead to a, a kind of a, a, a dangerous, uh, uh, out of control sensualism, where he, he feared that cant cantorial music would become part of a, a general culture of, part of the general culture of what he saw as being immor immorality and erotic excess, where he, he claimed that cantorial records were being played in the red light district. Um, uh, and, you know, he, he, he his, his, uh, there's a kind of a, like, a, a, a out, an out of control quality to his, his, uh, his discourse about it as well. Right? He's, he, he really believes that the, this new, new, uh, new, new format for, for cantorial music is going to, is going to lead to a terrible degradation for the community. And he tried to get people to not record, right? He 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 circulated a document in which he you know he he got cantors to pledge that they would not record sacred music, and um, this idea that there's something impure in the aesthetic movement, or that there's something destructive about cantorial aesthetics, became a part of the general cultural scene. It was not it was not uh, just kind of one crazy guy, right? It became part of the way Cantor, uh, uh, critics of, of cantorial music spoke about the music. Um, so there's this uh, gentleman here is uh, Elias Selukovsky, uh, who was another uh, Eastern European cantor. He was, he was uh, born in Poland, the, the son of a very, very well-known uh, late 19th century Polish cantor. And Zelikovsky was a, a modernizer. He was someone who was very, very heavily int interested in in bringing elements of, of European classical music into into cantorial performance, and he sang European classical music in his in his in, and he sang in concerts in in, uh, in concert halls. But he believed that uh, gramophone records were a, 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 a step too far, and that also he. He was kind of uh, trying to de delimit what were the what were the what what are the limits of what a cantor can or cannot do and still be expressing kind of the ethical qualities of the music, and he he, he coined this term hefker chazanus. Uh, hefker is a term from uh, Tom, the from the Talmud when when something is uh, is hefker it means it's been abandoned right it's its owner has has left it somewhere like if you you know if you uh if you drop uh, your wallet in the street you know it at a certain point it becomes hefker it is it, no one owns it it because it has been abandoned and uh this idea of hefker chazanus i i think there's a more than one one way more than one way when one can look at this this term because on, on the one hand it's it was used as a term of um of critique, right? That the, the critics of Cantor said the Cantors were abandoning their ethics and allowing their music to become this expression of uh, uh, wanton sensuality or excessive commercialism or uh, you know d d let, letting go of this this hard earned dignity that the Cantors had been seeking to to uh, to attain over the course of the nineteenth century, and that uh, what, what was important 
about uh, well, the Hefka was was a was an action of cantors in relationship to to their sacred calling as performers of sacred music. Uh, but Hefka is also uh, used by cantors to describe their uh, economic setting, right, or or the the way their treatment by the community. And this became a major major issue for cantors in the United States, where they saw that the can cantors could have brief periods of extreme success, especially if they were making records and doing concerts. But then uh, later in their careers, they could be completely abandoned by their communities, right? And this image of the of the elder cantor uh, cast out and no longer no longer able to fulfill the desires of the community. This is a very, very rec uh, constantly recurring image in the way, way cantors were talking about their own careers, right? And this became the basis for the incentive to unionize and, and, uh, and modernize the, the cantorial profession. Hefke is also used in Yiddish literature to describe the uh, the position of Jews in Europe, right? And this is starting, you know, in the, with the uh, the pro pogroms of the of the first decade of the twentieth century, but extremely accelerated in the First World War when uh, you know the entire Jewish communities were being being destroyed, and in, in, uh, and then the pogroms of the of the teens and twenties also, you know, we we see this kind of period of of uh, of mass violence, right? Where where you know there will be hundreds or even thousands of casualties in a single day. And this idea of the Jews being Hefka, right, becomes a very very central part of the anxieties of the community, uh, and also part of the way cantors talk about their craft. So in the nineteen twenties, the can cantorial music again was shifting, uh, increasingly focused on a concept of memorialization. In the 20s, the most popular uh, cantor was Zavok Kfartin, uh, who uh, he had, he, his career, recording career be, began in the 19 aughts in, in Budapest, where he was a cantor. But after he moved to the United States in 1920, he really, his, his work really took off. And he started making these records that encapsulate a kind of a, a highly theatrical version of what he and he represented, he, he described as being the sound of small town Jewish life, right? He made these records that are uh, very theatrical, uh, very uh, a sound of a, a highly distraught sound, uh, a sound of, uh, of crisis, I, I would say, right? And that these, these records are, are in some way related to the, the new, the new, uh, the new crisis in the political life of, of the Jews of, of Eastern Europe. And then finally, Hef Hefker is also used in, in modernist Yiddish circles to describe uh, the possibilities of, of modernity, right? When, when, uh, when uh, the, the, Jewish, the, the Jewish community or intellectuals within the Jewish community have uh, set aside uh, traditional life ways and the traditional expectations of the Jewish community, uh, what possibilities are now awakened? What what transformations of, of the tradition can uh, be undertaken by people who are no longer uh, bound by the ritual laws, but are instead looking to the tradition as a source of material to create new works of art? And I think uh, that's also a very important part of the 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 work the cantors are doing in this period, especially perhaps in, in regards to the, the work of the, the Hosentons, or their work makes this this idea especially clear, right? That that by uh, push, pushing aside the authority of of uh, of of uh, of of, uh, of uh, r rabbinically sanctioned uh, c communal life, new possibilities suddenly emerge for for creativity and the creation of new kinds of community. Uh, okay, how are we doing on time? Well, we're, we're, we're a little low on time, but maybe I'll, I'll go for like, you know, a few more minutes if that's okay. Uh, so th this is a, this is maybe a, a somewhat less interesting part of the story is that, you know, if you talk about a golden age, that this implies that people see a decline, right? There's some kind of a, there's some kind of a, a, a slippage, right? That that what would once was great has now fallen. And certainly in the way people talk about cantorial music, this is a, a major theme that uh, crops up again and again. Uh, and, you know, when, when I look at this, this period of 
you know, let's say beginning in the very late 1940s through, let's say the 1980s, we don't, from, from in the, in the late forties, there were still star canters. There, there was still a, an economy of Jewish records and, and radio stations by the 1980s, the cantorate had largely transformed to its more, the more familiar form that we, we, uh, in the United States are, are, uh, uh, know about today in which cantors are functioning as kind of a, uh, educators that certainly are still leading prayer services in synagogues, but their their role as kind of a, a creative artists who are looked to as um, you know a desired form of Jewish art is that that has pretty much passed its moment by the nineteen eighties, uh, and the question that arises is why you know why did cantors go from being uh, more or less kind of kind of like superstars people were selling hundreds of thousands of records and international touring careers to this n new new style of uh of of uh of, of a concept of what a cantor is which is much less focused on aesthetics and much less focused on on performance and uh, in, in part this relates to a normative story in, in american uh, jewish life around the uh the changed role of Yiddish culture, right? As as the the uh, J Jewish po uh, population moved away from from its its initial urban sites of of life into 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 the suburbs, uh, the sounds of Jewish difference associated with the Yiddish language and with uh, with uh, the kind of the 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 radical alterity, the the very very extreme difference. The, of of Jewish sound in comparison uh, to the norms of American life uh, became something that that uh, the second and third generation of Jews were less uh, less comfortable with, right? I think that that is uh, frequently heard, uh, you know, this kind of a, a sense that the Yiddish language is something that needs to be kind of buried or that is shameful. Uh, also relates to people's attitudes towards towards chazanas. And then certainly the establishment of cantorial schools also changed the music, right? That rather than being uh, an economy of individual artists who were highly unique, uh, who were highly competitive with one another, and were trying to stake out identities as as charisma-based artists, instead cantors were being trained uh, uh, through a rational curriculum, right, that was where everyone is receiving the same education, everyone is kind of expected to more or less learn how to do the same, same, uh, same thing. And this had uh, an impact on, uh, on the, the basis of the music in, in charisma, and in, uh, in the kind of the sublime effect of, of uh, art artistic creativity. And then, you know, finally, there's the, the issue of the changed musical uh, musical formats of the, of the American synagogue, where new repertoires uh, of, of synagogue music were created that were much more focused on uh, communal singing of, uh, of, of hymns, basically, right? Like something that's more or less based on the format of a unison hymn, which is a very American style of worship music, uh, has become the, the norm in, I would say, all aspects of all, all branches of American uh, Jewish life, including orthodoxy, where the musically marked moments and services also involve um, everyone singing together in usually a unison, a, a unison uh, musical texture, as opposed to this kind of a heterophony of cantorial soloist and people um, saying the prayers uh, individually all at the same time, but not in unison, which is kind of the uh, the soundscape of of the cantorial synagogue in uh, in the mid mid twentieth century. The cantorial revival in the Brooklyn Hasidic community. Uh, I th we already touched upon this a little bit uh, in, at the beginning of of the uh, of of my talk today. Uh, cantors in the Hasidic community understand the music as being uh, an art form that's based in the individual the charisma of cantors, and that ha has in it uh, built into the genre uh, the possibility of offering a very radically personal individual approach to music making and uh my my uh 
my uh, my friend Yankee Lemmer, the great 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 uh, cantor, probably the best one of the best known cantors of the current generation. Uh, he you know he he kind of uh, was explaining the this the uh, the phenomenon to me when in, in one of our early interviews, and he uh, put, puts forward that you know for Hasid, Hasidic Jews who uh, are uh, interested in the early 20th century Jewish cultural, uh, this world of creativity, uh, the cantoral music has a unique quality as being both uh, a pathway towards individual creativity, but also uh, a way of expressing uh, one's spiritual commitment to, to Jewishness, right? This is a, a way to, to be able to negotiate between these these desires and find a pathway forward without denying one or the other. Uh, and this has led to a remarkable outcropping of, of young artists in this, you know, they're singing music that was uh, from 100 years ago, right? So this is a, a very uh, striking and exciting music scene. Uh, but but Hasidic Jews are not the only people who are involved in, in, uh, in cantoral revival. And there are a bunch of artists coming from different uh, corners of the Jewish world today who are interested in, in, in early 20th century cantoral music. And I, we don't have much time, but I want to highlight the work of, of one artist, uh, Judith Berkson, who's all, all, also a, a dear friend. Uh, and Judith and I are, are working together now to start a, a record label uh, that we're going to, we're calling Chazonis Underground to, to, uh, uh, promote the work of, of artists coming from from different uh, different branches of the Jewish world uh, who are involved in this undertaking of kind of uh, uh, exploring and unearthing and transforming uh, the uh, the sacred music tradition. Uh, so let's see. Uh, I'll just play real quick just to end out today um, a a video of of uh, of Judith's music and and uh, all right. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs>
right. Thank you so much, everyone. And Jeremiah, yeah. thank you so, so much. I know it's time, but we are going to uh, take go with a few questions. I must say that as we were going along, many of the questions that came up, you've just answered through your presentation. So it was nice uh, to see that people were uh, receiving uh, uh, answers. Um, uh, I'll, I'll start maybe with um, uh, a, a very uh, technical question, because there was a question here about where it would be best to find Chazanut music today. Maybe I'll say we'll talk about that and I'll send it in the follow up emails so that we can have uh, uh, people uh, explore and see. And I actually wanted to ask you a little uh, about your own uh musical journey. I had some people here ask, how did you come up on that recording? So if you can say a little about your own musical journey and about your current uh, band, so people get to know a little more. Oh, sure thing. Okay. So uh, my musical uh, life, I, I'm from a musical family uh, and from a cantorial family. So my, my grandfather was a cantor named Jacob Konigsberg. And I actually have one of his concert posters uh, from the 1960s up there behind me. And he was kind of uh, born as late as possible to still have kind of been a participant in this, this early 20th century cantorial scene. Uh, he was making records and performing in, on, the, on the Catskill Jewish uh, Jewish resort circuit and had major cantorial pulpits uh, throughout his career. And I sang with him, right? You know, I, both in the home and our family and in his choir as a, as a youngster and, uh, and listened to, to early cantorial records with him. And so this, uh, this was a major part of our family life was, was this music. And so uh, there was never a time in my life when I wasn't interested in, in, uh, in Chazanus. Uh, but, uh, well, I, when I wanted to, when I, I start, first started getting interested in becoming a musician myself, uh, when I began to play the guitar and I was very focused on early 20th century, uh, blues music. So it's, which in some ways, maybe it kind of parallels my interest in, you know, in, in cantorial, uh, culture and music. Uh, and I spent many years playing with an elder blues musician named Carolina Slim and was kind of his accompanist. And then, uh, uh, I've been running a, a, a band, kind of like a rock band, uh, called The Sway Machinery. Uh, and that is a project that, you know, we've made many records and performed around the world. And um, and the kind of the print, the guiding principle is to try to uh, find some way to, to celebrate the cantorial tradition, but, you know, using the tools of of, uh, of the music of New York City and, uh, and the, the multiple kind of cultural universes that I, that I, I live in. And um, uh, so it's social music, you know, it's kind of like, um, it's kind of, a, it draws on the, the ritual aspect of the music, but, but towards a different, a different goal of, uh, you know, of, of creating uh, life and joy uh, in, in different kinds of spaces. But, but, we, but I, I work in, in synagogues as well. I mean, uh, there's been a community that I've been the, the High Holidays music director for many years uh, called Because Jewish. And my band plays at those services. And so it's, and that's a, a, a nice meeting point of the, the musical concept with a, a, a ritual, uh, uh, you know, a situation where, where people are able to appreciate the music as uh, a, a kind of a, a kind of a prayer experience. So, um, yeah, that's a little bit about my work. And then I'm an academic, I, I went back to, to school and did a PhD at Stanford, and was doing research about uh, Hasidic cantors uh, for many years. And, you know, in, in that video that I played at the beginning of the, of the, of the talk today, uh, I, you know, I, I'm there, you know, I'm, I'm in that room. I, I'm not the person who was filming. I, I had some reticence about uh, filming people because I, I, there's something a little subversive about this music. And I don't always feel like I want to be the one who's showing who's there, you know, in, in, uh, in my work, but somebody else made that video and posted it on YouTube. So I, I use it uh, in my talks very often as it captures kind of the, the vibe and the ethos of what this, this music scene is about. Uh, and after, after, after graduating, uh, I've continued my research and I, I'm working on a book now, a second book project that's about early, early 20th century cantorial music. 
Amazing. Thank you. So I'm going to I'm going to squeeze in two more questions. And before I get to another one that has to do with your projects, I did want to ask, there's a question here from Phyllis about the relationship between the canter you mentioned uh, from Vienna and Schubert and mm -hmm. how much if you can describe maybe a little of the influence uh, that he had on the music. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so uh, Seltzer's music is very interesting. You know, he, he's, he wrote a lot of melodies that, that are still quite familiar, like the Shema Yisrael uh, melody that, that is used in synagogues around the world was, was by Seltzer, and he has an Adon Olam that's very, very common. Uh, his music was uh, an attempt to uh, both transform and preserve. You know, in, in Germany, in this late, late eight late 18th, early 19th century period, uh, the, the the first wave of the reform movement uh, was seeking a, a kind of a total transformation of Jewish liturgy, including no longer using Hebrew in, in prayer services and singing uh, German language uh, hymns as, as the, the main form of, of, of music. And Seltzer, he saw himself as being a conservative, right? He was he he was keeping the the traditional Hebrew liturgy, and he was preserving many uh, many of the the traditional melodies that were used by cantors, uh, although he arranged them in a in a, a slightly transformed uh, manner. So he was writing for a four part choir using the rules of Western harmony and counterpoint, and his music sounds a lot like Schumann or Schubert, you know, his contemporaries, the relationship with Schubert is particularly important because he was a great can he was a great singer, right? Um, you know, Seltzer more than anything, probably, I mean, all we know about him now is are his compositions and his, the, his written works, but he was supposed to have been this incredibly uh, wonderful vocal artist. And he was the, one of the principal interpreters of, of Schubert's leader. You know, he, he would, you know, be singing uh, Schubert's music in, in concerts and in salons in Vienna, and they were friends. So, you know, and, and he, he commissioned Schubert to write uh, a, a, a setting of one of the Psalms, and uh, it's, it does not sound anything like what, you know, we would maybe typically consider to be synagogue music or, or cantorial music, but it was very much appreciated by the Jews of Vienna, right? This was a, a sign of their kind of arrival as an acceptable part of the community uh of of the 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 cap capital of the empire right so this was uh the the extent to which jews were uh legally uh emancipated you know was 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 shifting in this period right and so, so the jews were emancipated in in the austro-hungarian empire but what that meant was kind of contingent upon different different emperors different regimes uh it was not set right so symbol the symbolism of having uh this liturgical music that you know was created alongside some of the um you know the greatest composer the viennese christian composers uh was very important to people and definitely it influenced all all throughout the the european jewish world this this uh transformation was very, very influential. So, you know, can cantors in small towns in Europe knew who Seltzer was and, and wanted to be like him. You know, I mean, at the same time, people felt that it went too far in some ways. So this is kind of this is this sort of a, an east west uh, conflict around the music uh, of trying to understand uh, well, what are the limits of, of what we can how much we can change the tradition and have people still uh, believe that it is uh, a truthful re uh, representation of the of the what a Jew sounds like. Thank you. Um, I, so I'm I'm going to end with another question about um, your own work. Uh, there's the project you did with uh, women singing Nigunim that was uh, uh, mentioned also in the news. So if you can say a few words about that project. Uh, so um, I'm I, are you, maybe you're th you're you're talking about Capella r r this r r r uh, so I I'm not uh, I'm r giving a lecture about that but I wasn't involved in producing that in any way but I'm very very interested in this rec uh, this there was a record made last year last year uh, by a, a woman named Hannah Roskin who is a from a, a Lubavitch uh, Hasidic family and she she has been uh, for the last maybe ten years leading women's uh, nig nigunim uh, circles in the Orthodox community, which is very radical, you know, very, very uh, groundbreaking. Uh, the, the kind of situation I was talking about uh, where women were singing cantorial music was possible in the early 20th century, in part because 
the Jewish community was a lot more liberal in the early 20th century than it is today. I mean, there, there is, or including orthodoxy, right? The Jewish orthodoxy has become much more extreme, especially around issues relating to, to gender in the last uh, 50 years, let's say. So this is, there's a, been a, a radical swing to the right. And so for, for women in the, in the Hasidic community, even in Chabad, which is comparatively liberal in, in, in you know, within the, the Orthodox world, um, is, is new, you know, it's a, that's a, that's a new, a new, new, uh, new situation. And it, she made a beautiful record. And, um, so I'm going to be giving a lecture, uh, at the university of Pennsylvania in a, in a few weeks, uh, about her work. And, uh, yeah, I would love for you all to come, come to that. So thank you but, so much. Yeah. Yeah. Oh no, no. I'm sorry. I was Go just going to say that, that uh, the the Chazantas are. That's a major point of my research, and I'm also uh, producing a record of women cantors today interpreting the music of the Chazantas, and that album is going to come out uh, in early 2024. Uh, thank you, everyone, for for participating today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.